Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a round of applause as he joins us over here. Group President, Reliance Industries, former CEO, Nat Grid, Mr. Raghu Raman. A warm welcome Thank to you. you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I said good evening. I know I'm standing between you and the bar and I think uh, the people who are left here are teetotalers because <laughs> as you saw from my CV, um, I had a pretty unusual career. I spent about 10 years in the armed forces, another 10, 12 years in the corporate sector and five years in the government and a lot of my friends asked me which one of these three careers was the most difficult one. I haven't yet got the answer to that one but I can tell you the easiest one was the army because in the army at least you knew which side the enemy was. In the other two careers, it's kind of hard to figure out. Now, uh, when MB asked me uh, about a month ago to come and speak on, uh, on being bold, and I'm thinking, what am I going to talk to a, 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 a few hundred uh, creative people? After all, you're the people who tell stories and you create narratives. Uh, which get uh, million dollar campaigns happening, which build brands. Uh, you, you're the people who get people to take hard earned money out of their pockets and, and spend it on uh, stuff that they sometimes really don't need. Uh, you get people to tattoo uh, names of brand on their, uh, on their bodies, on their biceps. And when I think about it that way, in our game, we have to build narratives in which we have to take men into battle without ESOP, pay hikes, employee of the month or any one of these jamburis. We have to get people to jump on a grenade to save the lives of their comrades. And while you might get people to tattoo stuff on their body, we need soldiers to be able to hack uh, and ampute in the field, uh, ampute of legs which have been blown up by mines, uh, bullets uh, that I've hit with no morphine, nothing, with just a bayonet. So I guess we both have uh, some element of uh, narrative in our professions. And, and it's based only on those narratives that we are able to make all these things happen. When you lose campaigns, you lose millions of dollars. When we lose campaigns, we lose lives. When you lose a campaign, you have a hard time explaining to a client why the product didn't sell. When we lose campaigns, we have to look into the eyes of widows and orphans and explain to those orphans why their fathers died. So it's a little bit of a risk in our game as well. Do you agree? Good. So what I'm going to do now is to take you through a few, uh, few narratives to try and explain how in our game, and by the way, you know, there's this uh, big fallacy that soldiers are not afraid and that's bullshit actually. Soldiers are very, very afraid because a soldier knows what a 7.62 mm bullet can do when it hits you. A soldier knows what it is like to die when your gut is spilling out and your life is going out with this intestines, you see people dying in front of you. I mean, you don't, I mean, I know there are some filmmakers here, you don't sing a song and, you know, when you get hit by a bullet, you scream for your mother. So we are afraid too, and I want to explain to you how institutionally, individually, and sometimes introspectively, we find the courage to do what we do literally on a daily basis. And in our game, our mission statement is not to find children who have got lost in a beach. It is sometimes to pull out children who are inside bore wells from where they just can't be taken out by anyone else. So let me take you through some stories. Uh, none of these stories are mine except the last one. So this is, I'm, I'm not uh, giving names here because this is a story of the Indian Armed Forces and actually of many armed forces, not just the Indian Army. Uh, and I'll therefore not specify specifically which are these stories and who are these people. So how it all begins is, uh, uh, in, in my own, how many of you have seen the movie Laksh? Yeah, so my life was a little bit like that guy, totally lost, I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I used to listen to the last guy who used to tell me, sometimes a commercial pilot, sometimes merchant navy. Then suddenly something happened in my life and I joined the army. Of course, within the three days of joining the army, I regretted my decision. I cursed the guy who gave me the idea. I cursed the bloody clerk who sold me the form in UPSU. Where the hell have I got myself into? Because we met this bunch of guys waiting for us in the Indian Military Academy. Now, these are drill sergeants whom we call drill ustads. And to give you a, a sort of a... Uh, metaphor of a drill ustad, if you take your worst nightmare, uh, add it with Frankenstein and with Dracula and make a composite person out of him and put him and the drill ustad uh, next to each other, you would probably use this creature, uh, choose this creature rather than the drill ustad. That's, that's the kind of guys these are, especially if you see that guy with the big moustache. She was my uh, drill ustad. And 
Their job is to take these young college going civilians and make them into officers. And the way they do that is by 18 months of hard, grueling work, they would hold you by the belt and shake you like that until your teeth chattered. And the, the kind of dialogues and narratives they would have. So, for example, in the NDA, we have the Khetrapal uh, Square, Drill Square. And it's named after uh, Second Lieutenant Khetrapal, who died when he was 21 and he was a Paramvir Chakra winner. And this constant narrative into our ear that you are slamming your foot on the Khetrapal Square. If you don't do it properly, you are not doing my best. You are Khetrapal's best. And that kind of a sort of a fervor that they would introduce into you, the kind of dialogues they would shout into your ear, GC, you're called a gentleman cadet. When GC will kill you here, you should know the honeymoon couple of Masuri that in the Indian Military Academy, Loha Forge is forging. That's the kind of dialogues that they would shout into our ears to make us go to the next level. And then when we would pass out, the same drill instructor who used to put a boot on the back of my neck and make me do push-ups over a sewer, that man would stand in ramrod attention in front of me and salute me because now I am an officer. And the last lesson that he would tell me, ki saab zindagi mein kahin pe bhi ja ke khada hoga, to aisa khada hona chahiye ki puri dunia ko malum ho ki tum nayar saab ka trained officer hai. That would be the kind of ethos that they, and there is a lesson there because when we train our youngsters, when we train our next generation, they have to be constantly reminded of what their previous generations have done, what their units have done, what their subunits have done, what their organizations have done. Let me share with you another story of a man who couldn't die. And again, these aren't stories which are particular to any one person. You might remember the Kargil operations in which we lost a lot of soldiers. We lost more than 600 soldiers. And I'm not telling you this story from the from the, uh, uh, the, the viewpoint of soldiering, I'm telling you this story from the viewpoint of parents who lost one of their sons. This, uh, I don't want to name the family, but this was a, a school teacher who came from a small village in UP near Lucknow. And his son, their son had died in the Kargil war in one of the most crucial operations uh, in Jubar Top where a post had to be taken. So after a year of the operation, the family came to see the place where their son had died. And like we do in the army, it was organized very well. We brought the, the family, the father and mother, they were old. Uh, we took them to Batalik sector. We took them all the way up, somehow managed to take them exactly to the spot where their son had died. And fortunately, there was an NCO, there was an Havaldar who was present with their son when their son was killed. And, and just to put this in context, uh, basically what had happened was that the Pakistani troops had occupied one of those posts and they had a machine gun there and that machine gun was overshadowing all the ingress and it was essential to take out that post before the operation could commence. And that post had to be taken out before first light because another battalion was beginning an attack and if this machine gun was not taken out, that attack and that battalion would be slaughtered. So this young officer who was 24 years old and he was there with just five other troops, including this Havaldar. They were hiding behind a rock and, and they were being shot at at literally point blank distance, just about 20 to 30 meters. And each movement that they would make, there would be a machine gun fire that would come and splinter the rocks around them. Each time they tried to raise their head, they knew that the only way to make this happen was a death charge. Now a death charge is when you know that as you will charge, that will be your final charge. And so this Havaldar got up and he told this officer, he said, this machine gun is very hai, and I'm going to now storm this. The 24-year-old boy caught his hand. That young lieutenant caught his hand and said, Sab, aap to bivi bale ho. you got a wife and kids. I'm young. I don't have a family. Let me be the one to do it. And then this NCO described the story to the parents. And he said, Sab, wo sab khade hue, aur chattan ki tarah khade hue. And the enemy kept firing and the bullets kept going through his body but he managed to reach that bunker, pull the grenade, put it inside the bunker, take those four soldiers along with him and he died but he made sure that that post was taken away. And that's a narrative when you hear, even those of you who have not been in uniform will feel something happening to you, something coursing through your blood 
making you feel that this is a cause for which you can actually go out of the box, you can go out of the limits that you have set for yourself. Let me tell you another story how units build a narrative and they don't all have to be very macabre. And this is a very interesting story. Uh, as the title itself says, the leopard that died of shame. And this is in one of the officer's messes of a unit where you have a leopard uh, which is mounted on the wall and there is a gold plaque under it which says the leopard that died of shame. Now when you hear a narrative like that, I mean, how can you pass that uh, trophy without hearing the whole story? So the story goes something like this. That in 71 Ops, this unit was posted towards the eastern sector where now Bangladesh is a, a, a country and they were involved in that operations. Those days, even now sometimes in some of the good units, the drinking sessions continue till late night, till one o'clock, two o'clock. In good units, it's not considered to be a good unit because will say khana lagao. First couple of times the Mesavaldar will not heat up the food because he knows that this boozing session. So we have something in common with the ad world that way. <laughs> So finally, it's two o'clock in the night and I want you to visualize this. Uh, it's, it's a very misty location, visibility is very low, it's in the middle of a jungle. Uh, the officers have left the mess and now the cook and the masalchi, they are cleaning the utensils and they are in, in, a, in a sort of a completely uh, dense forest area. And there are a lot of these stray dogs which are you know, fighting for scraps of food. So this masalchi who is cleaning this uh, uh, patilas and all of that, while he's cleaning it, he's tossing these pieces of food and the dogs are, you know, fighting on it and they are biting each other and all of that. And during that time, uh, one of the dogs comes especially close to this masalchi and keeps trying to snatch food from that uh, handi. And this masalchi gets so irritated as it is, wake up, have breakfast, lunch, dinner, raat ka ek baz gaya. I mean, he's in a very, very irritated mood. So he takes that uh, serving ladle that long, uh, I don't know what you call it in Hindi, but he takes that ladle and gives one whack to this dog and there's a yelping sound. And next day in the morning, they find an eight foot leopard lying dead there. So that leopard was mounted and kept in this mess. Ki look at this leopard who died of shame. Ki main kaan jungle ka raja, mere ko ek ne mar diya. Now this unit, their spirit comes from a story which says, Hamari paltanka to masalchi share mar deta hai, tum kis ki muli ho? Who are you messing with? Now that's how you build a narrative to an organization. And this is a very nice story, it's a funny story, but it has a story with a very strong message. Let me give you one more example of how you can at times create a very solid impact, a very big impact by staking everything on one single card. Now this is a demo that I saw many, many years ago as a small boy and it's still done by the Air Force. So the Indian Air Force does a firepower demonstration. And this demonstration is for about 20, 25 minutes. Usually the chief guest is the prime minister. The time that I saw it, uh, Indira Gandhi was the prime minister. And uh, again, you have to visualize this. Uh, there, there's the whole ambience, there are thousands of people waiting. And, and they're, they're, those of you seen the Republic Day Parade, you understand what I mean. They're all waiting from all walks of life. They want to see their Air Force give this you know, uh, demonstration of their firepower. And then the MC goes on the mic and he says that uh, the firepower demo is going to start in the next five seconds. I'll request everyone to be quiet and keep your eyes to your right-hand side because from the right-hand side, the first sortie that will fly will fly so low and so fast that if you blink your eyes, you will miss. And so everyone is anticipating their sudden silence in the crowd and they're all waiting. And suddenly you can hear the ground trembling as the roar of two fighter aircrafts comes one after the other and zips by, just goes over your head. And it's true that if you just blink, you will miss the flight because they're flying at 50 meters height and they're flying at subsonic speeds. So it's just like two huge shadows just passing over. And then the demo begins and there's this explosions happening, fighter aircrafts coming, taking out targets, attack hel helicopters coming, a lot of explosions, dust rising and all of that. And suddenly, when this dust settles, you notice that there is a helicopter that's always been hovering behind this dust cloud. And as the dust cloud settles, this helicopter starts hovering towards the prime minister's dais and comes slowly, foot by foot, slowly approaching the prime minister. And then from that helicopter, a paracommando slithers down. And he's carrying a brown packet in his back as he slithers down. And then he comes running to the prime minister salutes her and goes down in one knee and pulls back this packet and hands it over to her. 
and she's looking at it puzzled. He asks her to open it, and when she opens the packet, it is a picture, six by six picture of her face looking at the first aircraft which passed by. A photo taken with every detail of her face by a subsonic aircraft that went in 20 minutes, developed the picture, brought it back, transported it, and delivered to the Prime Minister to tell her what her Air Force can do. <laughs> they don't need to make a PowerPoint presentation about statistics. They are the PowerPoint. So this story which I heard today, a very similar one, about a picture being taken in front of a Coke machine, the Indian Air Force has been doing for the last 30 years. I want to end this with a, a personal story, and this was a story, uh, as you saw in my bio, I, I was in the armed forces for about 11 years, came back into the corporate world, and then after 26-11 happened, I was called back into the government to raise an organization called the National Intelligence Grid. It was called the NAT Grid, and the job of this organization was basically to fuse data from uh, literally thousands of different data sources and put, to, put them together in one single place. It's uh, kind of equivalent to the US NCTC or the GCHQ of UK. And uh, those of you who have had some experience of working with the government uh, know that it's like uh, pushing a string. It's not like pulling a string. To, to, to get a consensus to go and take a leak, you need a committee to sit down and decide whether we should go or not go. All those things, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Now, in an 18-month project, the first step that has to be done is to build what is called a DPR. A DPR is a detailed project report. Now, the process for that is you usually send out an RFP. Anyone who's worked with the government here, or at least tried to? Yeah, there you know. So you have to send out an RFP, then the RFP will be responded to by about uh, 16 people, then you have to weed them out, go through, I mean, it's a full beauty pageant, and you do this, that, and finally you will come down to the... So the whole process takes anywhere between nine months to 12 months to just get the vendor on board. And in an 18-month project, if you're gonna take 12 months to get the, uh, the, the consultant to come on board, then pretty much 90% uh, of the project time is gone in just deciding who to work with. When I began that project, I was given one office, one room office, one driver, and one PS, and one sheet of paper with a single line brief that you have to create the national intelligence grid. Your benchmark is the United States NCTC. Now let me put that in context in terms of a mission statement. If you take the US, after 9-11, they spent anywhere between 13 to 18 billion dollars, depending on which number you believe. They have one-sixth of our population. The entire population, all records, they're all kept in English, one language. Every person is tagged with a social security number. A child, when he is born, the first injection that he gets is based on a social security number. They have a completely plastic economy. So if you spend a couple of hundred dollars in cash in the US, you will be remembered. And they have one problem, the Al-Qaeda. They have two boundaries which are uh, benign countries and two boundaries which are the sea. Now let's take that problem and contextualize it to the Indian context. We have six times their population. We think we are not really sure. We are still counting. <laughs> we have 29 states and union territories, each one of whom operates in a completely different language. Not just a completely different language, but different processes. So the first information report, the FIR, which is filed in Punjab, doesn't go back to the British. It goes back to the Maharaja of Patiala. The FIR that is filed in Tamil Nadu goes back to the Maharaja of Travancore. Now in that diversity, we don't have one problem, we have various flavors of terrorism. We have Naxals, we have uh, fundamentalists, we have secessionists, we have Northeast terrorism, we have all sorts of problems. And our uh, black economy is supposed to be, I mean, depending on which number you believe, about twice or thrice of our legitimate economy. And we don't have $18 billion to spend, and we have 18 months to do this task, which the US took somewhere around uh, seven to eight years to accomplish. Now, if we went by the traditional route of floating an RFP, it wasn't going to happen. So completely out of the box, I reached out to about 20, 25 CEOs and completely cold call. CEOs from consulting firms, the McKinsey's of the world, Accenture, PwC, uh, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, and I told them that, do you remember where you were on 2611? Do you all remember where you were on 2611? You remember the first instance when you saw it on TV, the first person you SMS, the first person you SMS you and you were watching these 10 men come into your country and rape your country live. You were watching that. And then suddenly after 14 hours, you saw the black cats come 
And when these black cats started coming into your TV screen, that's the time the hair on your hands rose and you said that, Ab hamari bari. now we are going to show you what we are made of. I told those CEOs that here's an opportunity for you to get out of your armchairs and help us build the infrastructure which will prevent this from happening. And I can assure you, without exception, all the CEOs sent some of their best, and I told them, I'm not going to interview these people. I'm going to trust your judgment. I'm going to trust that you will send your best people. And all of them sent a couple of people, two people, three people. McKinsey sent four people. All of these organizations sent their best stars, and they gave them to us pro bono and said, just take these people from our side, and this is our contribution to nation building. We began that project, and when we began that project, we knew that we had to telescope it. We couldn't do uh, in the normal DPR structure, which takes about eight, nine months to build. And so we walked up to the board and we wrote 100 days there. And in this DPR team, there were some people who were experts in building DPR. There were some people uh, from Deloitte. There was a guy from Deloitte who has built about 15, 20 DPRs. And he kind of looked at everyone in, in a, in a wide-eyed amazement because the shortest DPR takes anywhere between about nine to 10 months to make. And he actually uh, you know, did a, a sign like this from the back, indicating to me that this guy is off his rocker. And that's when I took them. Uh, so we, 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 were, we were trying to find a way to motivate them. And uh, I had a HR, uh, uh, anyone from HR here? No? So well, you're shy of raising your hand? OK. <laughs> So we had an HR uh, person who said, you know, you need to get this team building exercise. You need to get them all in, you know, sort of fired up and uh, let's take them out to Goa or one of these places and do these, you know, falling back on each other kind of exercises to, you know, uh, uh, sort of forge them into a team. Uh, instead of that, I actually took them to the NSG headquarters. And the NSG gave a, a demonstration of what they could do there. And then they met the commanding officer who ran the 2611 operations. And uh, many of you may not know the context of that operation. You saw it on TV and all of that. But it was one of the uh, most uh, uh, textbook, I mean, more than 29 countries have come to India and studied how these boys did it. Because in 72 hours, they opened 1,000 rooms. And this room opening uh, drill, um, again, just to put it in context, there are two kinds of room opening drills. One is a room opening drill that you do in hostile territories. It's called hostile room opening. And you must have seen this in the movies. The team lines up next to the door. They place an explosive charge. The charge goes off. They toss a grenade inside. The grenade goes off. They put in the MP5 and lose a magazine. And then they storm into the room. You can't do that in Taj, Shabad, and Oberoi because there you have to attempt what is called a benign room entry. And that's because inside every room, you can have a terrorist. Inside every room, you can have a tourist. And inside every room, you can have a terrorist with a tourist. All three possibilities exist. So each room has to be opened with the same degree of caution, alertness, carefulness as the room before that, and the room before that, and the room before that, 1,000 times. And this officer also told this team that after the NSG took over, there was not a single collateral casualty. The only two people who died were the commandos, but not a single civilian was killed after the NSG took charge. And he told this team, And he told this team that we didn't have the floor plans. We had no idea what the hotel uh, layout looked like. We didn't know whether these, these AC ductings can take the weight of a man inside. We had no idea whether these walls have, uh, they can stop a bullet or they're bulletproof. We knew none of that. And all these plans were lying 100 meters away in the Brihan Mumbai office, but we didn't have access to it. So we went into this battle with our blindfolds around our eyes, our hands tied behind our back. All I'm asking you, all I am asking you on behalf of the National Security Guard, if you are half as good as what Raghu tells me you are, then next time we have to go into battle, please don't make us fight at a disadvantage. When we came back from the NSG headquarters in Manesar, the whole bus was quiet. These 35 people were completely quiet and somber. But I can tell you, I have never seen more passion in a group of disparate people who were at each other's neck because suddenly there was a purpose which was far larger than their bloody pity bickering about whose format to use and what kind of font to use. They suddenly found that there was a challenge which was far larger and we actually managed to complete to build the DPR in 110 days. <clears throat> I want to share this uh, last lesson. 
you don't need to see what happens in the forces or how the army does it and what are the kind of sacrifices uh, soldiers make to realize that every person sitting in this room and those who went away from this room belong to 0.00001% of humanity. You've all had a great education, you are in reasonably good health, you are in reasonably good wealth, you are that tiny minority of people whom, uh, who have actually won the lottery of life. Uh, next time, or why next time when you are flying back to your respective cities and as you are leaving the airport, just roll down the windows of your cars and look around you and you will see these tiny children who are darting about in traffic trying to beg and earn a little bit of money and if they don't bring back a certain amount of money each day, they get beaten. But for the grace of God, they could be your children. But for the grace of God, they could be you. And despite all the great things that we all have, we constantly feel this fear of attempting to do something bold. And I think that is really, really stupid because we pretty much have it all when it comes to the lottery of life. Just think about it as a metaphor that if you took your life and, and made it into a 35 millimeter film, you know the old uh, film? the celluloid film, and you strung it on this hall completely, and then someone came with a pair of scissors and started cutting out bits and pieces of it, and stuck it back together, you wouldn't even know that you have missed that much of life, because last Wednesday was exactly like the Wednesday before that, exactly like the Thursday before that. You keep repeating, we all keep repeating our lives exactly the same way. So if someone could snip out years out of your life and you are 40 years old and someone could snip out eight years out of your life and you didn't notice the difference, then you might not as well have lived those eight years. So think about it with that perspective and you'll suddenly realize if you just close your eyes for a second and visualize your greatest happiness, the greatest achievement, the greatest relationship, the greatest thing that has ever happened to you, and you're honest to yourself and you move back to time in history, you will find that the origin of the greatest happiness started at your worst time, at the time when you were hurt the most, at the time when you lost something the most. So it's only when you lose stuff, it is only when your relationships are tested, when you, are, when you yourself are tested, you realize the strength of both yourself and your relationships and your friends and the things that you have with you and that is a great gift. And that is why fear is actually a gift. It is a gift, if we manage it well, it can take us completely to a new level, completely to a new orbit. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.